I remember having a conversation with my wife who had a conversation with a social worker uh, some years ago in our neighborhood. And this social worker's role was to connect people in the community together. He was kind of a community center uh, social worker. And uh, so he provided services like uh, preschool, after school care, ESL classes, seniors programs, that kind of thing within our neighborhood uh, in the Sunset community area. And he said that part of his role was to bring people together, to create, he said, community. And he said he found meaning in that, creating community among the people, among the neighbors. People were looking for community. People in Vancouver were often feeling isolated and alone despite living uh, in close proximity to one another. Everybody kind of minds their own business and they don't really talk to each other. And so it's easy in a city like Vancouver to feel alone. But here's the really interesting part. He said that even after people find community, get connected to one another, get connected to these various services, he felt that he felt, he still felt like there was something missing in his work. People are looking for something deeper than just community, deeper than just personal connection. I think ultimately people are looking for meaning in their lives purpose in their lives. In a word, they're searching for God. And Scripture, the Bible, provides us with that, with the story of God. The good news is that there is a God according to Scripture. The good news is that God has made himself known to us in Scripture. And the good news is that God has made himself known to us through Jesus in history, all a testimony of Scripture. But first, I want to ask, what is Scripture? What is the Bible? What exactly is the Bible? I mean, we teach from it every week, and I'm sure uh, many of us read from it all the time. What is the Bible? Have you thought about that? What is the nature of these writings, which we call the Bible? Because I think the way you think about the Bible will change the way that you read it. So here are a few different ways of thinking about what the Bible is. Number one, the Bible is a set of theological truths about God. Number two, the Bible is a collection of historical documents about ancient Israel and the early church. Number three, the Bible is a guidebook teaching us how to live Rightly. Number four, the Bible is a true story of God's interaction with the world. So just look at these four answers, four very common answers about what the Bible is, and think, what do you think the Bible is? What is Scripture to you? And there's no real right or wrong answer here. There's one I think that I find is the best, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment, but each of these has correctness to them. Each of them is right in a sense. But which one speaks truly to your experience the most out of these four? Now, if you had to pick one, would be the one which would be the best answer, which one would you pick? Most fundamentally, I think the Bible is a story of God interacting with the world, a true story of God interacting with the world. So not only do I think Scripture is inspired, but I think the shape of Scripture is inspired. That is the way that Scripture unfolds itself and reveals itself to us and how God has revealed himself to us in it is actually inspired as well. So, for example, if you read some other scriptures from other religious traditions, like the Quran or the Hindu scriptures, the Vedas, or Upanishads, or the Buddhist scriptures, you won't have the same sense of narrative flow that you find in the Bible. What the Bible is, is there's this beginning, and then there's this middle, and then there's this end. There's this flow in the plot. There is a plot. There's a main storyline. And that's not the same 
in many other scriptures, most other scriptures in the world. I can summarize this plot of the Bible in a sentence. It is the establishment of the kingdom of Israel. And then we can kind of break this sentence into three main parts, I think. Part one, well, there's the prequel, first of all, from creation to Babel, but part one, I would say, is Abraham and the promise. There's this promise that's given to Abraham. That's the first part. The second part, this promise is finally fulfilled in Israel through David, King David, the establishment of this kingdom. It's been established. Part, that's part two. Part three, this kingdom fails. The king fails, even from the very beginning, from David onwards. But not just David, the whole line of kings fails as a whole. Failure. It's not that every king is complete failure, but as a whole, what happens is that the kingdom fails. Part one, part two, part three. The story of the Bible in a nutshell. Visually, it might look something like this. Genesis to Babel, the promise to Abraham, part two. Israel, the kingdom, part three. Exile. How we understand what the Bible is impacts how we understand what the gospel is, what the good news is. And that's what we've been looking at the last couple of weeks and in this series. The gospel, in light of this whole story, has been our subject. What is a whole gospel according to the whole Bible, a biblical version of the gospel? And the gospel is that there is a conclusion to this story. There is a conclusion to this story which finds itself in a question mark. Where is the kingdom? The conclusion to that story is found in the New Testament in Jesus as the king. So I want to look at that first verse that we had just read out to us from uh, Heather um, just now. This is one of the gems, I think, in the New Testament as, as we think about what is the gospel because Paul spells it out in one sentence, what is the gospel. He says, remember Jesus Christ. Remember Christ means Messiah, right? Messiah means anointed. Anointed are kings. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. That's as short as you get. As succinct, as succinct as you can get. This is my gospel. But notice, again, the emphasis here. Remember Jesus, Messiah. That means this emphasis on kingship, the kingship of Jesus. Raised from the dead. So remember we talked about resurrection from crucifixion. The emphasis in Romans chapter 1, what was Paul really emphasizing there in his resurrection? It was what? Again, his exaltation and kingship, that even though he was crucified and no king in the ancient world could be recognized as a king if they were crucified, even though Jesus was crucified, Paul is saying he was resurrected, and that's the evidence that he is still king. And then this third phrase, descended from David. Again, who is David? Right? He was the greatest king of Israel, according to their memory, their social memory, their understanding of who he was, their, their religious memory of him. David, the greatest king, descended from this line. This is who Jesus is. This is the good news. And we looked at that word, too, euangelion in the Greek. And there's this background, which is a proclamation of God universal good news beyond just kind of what we think sometimes of salvation or just the church or just a spiritual um, understanding of the gospel. No, gospel is much, much bigger and wider than that. This is good news for everyone. This is good news. Whether you hear it or not, this is good news for the whole world. Jesus is King. He is Lord. So that's what we've been looking at the last uh, few weeks. And so just to summarize again, um, week one, we looked at distortions and distractions, some of the things that maybe sometimes we have caricatured or maybe truncated 
um, or shortened the, the, the real gospel, the full gospel. Second week, we looked at this notion, Jesus really is king. That's the core of the gospel, the sweet spot of the gospel. Today, we're going to look at what kind of kingship Jesus, Jesus exercises in this world. So a different kind of king. And then in, in the uh, subsequent weeks, we're going to continue to look at this, uh, this uh, subject of gospel, using it as a lens to talk about different issues. So we're going to look at, um, just to get the next slide, we're going to look at evangelism, the church, discipleship, society, transformation, and worship. So, I mean, the gospel is such a wide-ranging subject, such an um, impactful subject, it should be. And so we're just going to look at from the lens of this good news of who Jesus is and how it impacts these various areas of our lives. Okay? And today, again, we're looking at this notion, who is this king? What kind of a king is Jesus? What kind of a king is Jesus? Now, the whole idea of kingship is a little bit foreign to us, isn't it? What is your experience of kingship? What's our experience of kingship today? Is, is this a king? Oh, well... <laughs> Can you guess who that is? It's, it's a picture of King Charles, sliced in half. <laughs> so, just imagine the whole King Charles there. Is this, is this a king? Well, I guess in our day, that this is what we call a king, but is he a, a real king in the sense of real power and influence and impact? Not so much, right? Ceremonially, ceremonially, yes, a king, but on paper, yes, a king. But does he have real impact and power and influence? Well, maybe not so much here in Canada. Maybe in the UK a little bit more. Uh, wealth, certainly, but real political power and impact? Not so much, right? Um, how about this? Is, is this a king? Right? Our leaders today, we call them prime ministers. Um, well, in, in Canada, maybe as kind of a little humble nation among the world, maybe we wouldn't consider him uh, a king. Oh, how about this one? Is that a king? Right? A little bit more power now, or maybe a lot more power, uh, the president of the United States. The leaders of our world today, we call prime ministers, presidents. So are they kings? Now, what is our experience of kingship today? Well, in the ancient world, kings had absolute power, absolute power. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So one of Israel's neighbors was Egypt. And in the Egyptian worldview, reality was made up of four different parts. There was, first of all, the realm of the gods, the, the spiritual realm. Second, is the king or the pharaoh of the people. Third is the realm of the dead and the deceased. And fourth, finally, is the realm of humanity and what's visible. So this picture kind of depicts that, the pharaoh at the center of all things as a mediator between what is spiritual and what is tangible. And the pharaoh is at the center of all that. He is a mediation between the gods and the world. So he is like a God. In fact, he's better than a God to them because he is God enfleshed. He is the God who is among them and who lives among them and takes care of them and leads them. He's the intermediary between the spiritual world and, and uh, the physical world. And because of that role, then, he had absolute power. He was a gatekeeper of all of the spiritual power in the world. And so after he would uh, lead the armies in victory, then, then he would offer sacrifices so that they would continue to have good fortune from the gods, from the spiritual world, that that, that might become uh, reality, continue to come into their reality in history. 
And so he had the power to judge, to lead, to conquer. Okay, here's a, a second example. Another of Israel's neighbors, the Assyrians. The Assyrians worshipped their god, whose name was Asher, after whom the name Assyria was named. And in their worldview, Asher was the supreme king, this god of the heavens. But not just god of the heavens, because the king of Assyria was a regent of this Assyrian god. That is, he is a representative of this heavenly god, Asher, the, the, the physical human king, was the representation of that king, of that god. And this king, this Assyrian king, exercised his absolute power with viciousness and cruelty throughout the ancient world. They were actually known for their cruelty. So if you read the Assyrian history books, which the empire lasted almost 2,000 years, this is the refrain that echoes again and again through their histories. I destroyed, I devastated and burned with fire those which resisted my rule. I destroyed, I devastated and burned with fire those which resisted my rule from the, the, the emperors of the Assyrian Empire. Famous in the ancient world for their cruelty and brutality, they would skin their captives alive, cut off their limbs, torture them, and set them as examples for their enemies that they might be feared. So this relief shows some of that torture. This is the world of the ancient kings. And then in Jesus' time, we have another example, King Herod, later on. So Herod the Great, he is called in history, we also have uh, emperors like Nero and Caligula. They didn't do that much better in terms of their exercise of their power. So Herod the Great, he's a half-Jewish, half-pagan, so-called self-proclaimed king of the Jews. He's king of Judea at Jesus' birth. So he suspected his own wife and his mother-in-law for conspiring against him. And so what did he do? He murdered them. He killed them. He suspected three of his sons for wanting his power as they were uh, maturing and growing up. He killed them. He killed his son, or three of his sons, his wife, his mother-in-law, just to continue to retain that influence and power. This was the exercise of his kingship. This is the world of ancient kingship in Jesus' day. So on the one hand, we have modern examples of kingship, half of King Charles and, you know, Justin Trudeau. And then on, on the other hand, we have ancient versions of kingship. What is Jesus like as a king? Let's turn to our text, Philippians chapter 2. This is one of the most profound passages in the New Testament, Philippians chapter 2. It's been the source of some of the church's oldest creeds and confessions about the identity of who Jesus is as the Son of God. For today, I just want to ask one question. What does this say, this text say about Jesus' kingship? What kind of king is Jesus? Is he like these ancient kings with absolute power, terrifying, cruel power even? Is he like that? Well, our passage describes a kind of journey that Jesus went through, the three-part journey. Verse 6 and 7 is the first part. Verse 8 is that middle part. And then verses 9 to 11 is the third part. So verse 6 to 7. Being in the form of God, this describes his life before he became human. It's in the middle of that paragraph there. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. In the form of God. And then verse 8, talking about his life on earth. Though he was in the form of God, he took on the form of a human. He took on the form of a human being. And not only just a human, 
But a servant, which by the way is also translated slave in the Greek, it's the same word. So he took on the form of a slave as a human being, not only a slave, but dying as a human being. So obedient to the point of death is how Paul puts it. And not just dying, but dying on a cross of all things in the ancient world, which was a shameful, shameful thing. And then in verses 9 to 11, talking about his life after his resurrection. And then God exalted him to heaven so that every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth should bow to him. So you could think of this movement that we're kind of seeing from heaven down to earth and then being exalted back to heaven is kind of like, I think of it like a parabola, if you guys know mathematics. So um, parabola is from infinity going all the way down to zero and then going all the way back up to infinity again. What kind of king is Jesus? How does he conquer his enemies? Does he just step over them? Does he just, just, just conquer over them with his power and might and strength, which he has? No. The kind of king was that he was so humble that he came down to earth, not just to earth, but as a human being, not just as a human being, but as a slave, as a servant, not just as a servant, but as someone who died for the sake of his people on a cross, all the way down to zero. And then the good news is that God raised him up, raised him up from death, resurrected him. Death could not have hold over him, and now he's exalted in heaven as king of the universe. That's the kind of king he is. It's, I think, difficult to even convey this kind, the magnitude of this movement. In fact, uh, this passage which we, which we had read out to us in the Greek is really quite poetic by the structure and the words that are used. It's as if Paul, and we think that this, we call it the Christ hymn, this part of Philippians really it probably was a song, a hymn, part of the worship of the early church that as Paul is writing and thinking about Christ and his descent to earth and then his reascent and exaltation to heaven, it's almost as if he couldn't but help break out into worship, into song, into praise of who Jesus is. That's the extent, the magnitude of this kind of movement from heaven to earth back to heaven. I think uh, we all understand the sacrifice that love takes, but it's, it's difficult to, to conceive of the magnitude um, of this kind of sacrifice. Because like, like as friends, we kind of sacrifice for friendship, right? Like if, if, if we have a friend who invites us out to go do something and we're kind of busy, well, chances are we'll, we'll sacrifice what we're doing to go accompany our friends because that's, that's what friends do. That's what friends are. And when you get married and you start to live together, and you, you think, oh, well, I can't just live the way I've always lived because I have to kind of make compromises. You kind of have to sacrifice a little bit of, of who you are so that you can live together as one unit, as a, a single family. When you have kids, then you start sacrificing a little bit more. It seems like for 20 years at least, right, that you're just giving and giving, and they're kind of, their kids are kind of making room into your life but imagine God, the creator. He has no needs in the sense that we do. He has no frailties in the sense that we do. God becoming human, the kind of sacrifice that that is. The text says that Jesus, though he was in the form of God, emptied himself. He just literally emptied himself. That's the kind of sacrifice that Jesus has for us. That's the kind of a king that we have in Jesus. I don't think any of us can really truly fathom and appreciate that kind of kingship. Now, that's not like the ancient kings of the ancient world, right? You see that contrast? Totally, totally different. 
So on the other hand, is Jesus like the kings and queens of our day, though? And I intentionally included verses 5 and 12 in our text because I think sometimes we lose sight of this aspect of kingship, which is obedience. Because this text is embedded in this context of the Philippian church in which Paul was asking the church to obey Jesus. So I'm just going to move to um, the text. So here's verse 5 and verse 12. Let each of you look not to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. That's the first verse that it begins with just before it. And at the end, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So what's going on in the church in Philippi is that there's this kind of uh, people kind of, uh, there's some disunity, maybe people kind of one-upping one another. And he says, Paul says, don't think like that. Don't have that kind of, have the mind of Jesus. In other words, this is a command. It's an imperative. And then, right at the center of our text, it was a Christ hymn, and this, and this verse here about Jesus, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. So obedience, obedience, obedience. The point is that Jesus' kingship is not just token kingship. Jesus' kingship is not just ceremonial kingship. There is this deep sense of obedience that Paul is trying to inculcate. He's trying to work out in the Philippian church. And just, that's why he says literally, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. That there's a sense of Jesus is king. Yes, he has that same kind of power that the Assyrian and the Egyptian kings did have. He didn't take advantage of it. He didn't utilize it in the sense of bringing his enemies down and stepping on them. He instead gave that power up for us. And yet, he is still king. He is still Lord over this universe. And so as you come to this knowledge of the understanding of who Jesus is as king, he's inviting us, Paul is inviting us, to continue to have that sense of obedience and lordship of Jesus in our lives. If the core of the gospel is that Jesus is king and lord over this universe, and he's demonstrated that through his resurrection from the dead, then the flip side of that kingship is our obedience. Our willing obedience to this king. This king, he knows your life. This king, he sees your life. He knows every aspect of your life. And this king has an opinion about your life and my life. He doesn't just actually have an opinion about it. He actually has words for us imperatives for us, commands for us. He wants us to do and to obey certain things in all areas of our lives. But the point is not just for us to feel guilty and uh, afraid, right? He's not the Assyrian kings. He is a true king, but he's a king in, who exercises his kingship through sacrifice and love. The point is that we fuse together our obedience with our worship of him. So every Sunday we come here, Tiago and team, they lead us in worship and we sing these wonderful songs about our praise of him and our worship of him. But what this text shows me is that our worship of him and our obedience to him, they need to go hand in hand. So that when we leave this place on Sunday morning, we don't go back to our lives, and everything kind of just looks the same. Right? We don't disrespect people, and we treat people the way that we would um, if we hadn't encountered Jesus. There's this fusion of our life here in worship and our everyday life that needs to happen. 
this togetherness between uh, our worship and our obedience. Um, I'm inspired by the story of Keith Green. Some of you might know him. I kind of date myself a little bit when I say that, that name, Keith Green. Now, I didn't listen to him growing up because I'm not that old, but um, he's this wonderful musician, uh, one of the early pioneers of the modern Christian praise songs. Extremely, extremely talented musician, and he was pursuing fame and fortune as a musician in the early 70s uh, in Los Angeles. And in the midst of that pursuit of fame and fortune as a musician, he became a Christian. He met Jesus. And after that encounter, his life changed. He devoted all his energy, all his time, his musical talent to the Lord instead of for himself. So his focus was no longer about his own musical career, but now it was about encouraging others and challenging others and worshiping and helping others to worship Jesus. And he would give concerts and he would stir thousands of people to missionary work through his concerts. He would challenge thousands of people to rededicate their lives and to re-give their lives to discipleship to Jesus through his concerts. You might recognize some of the more, common, uh, more famous songs that he wrote, still sung today. There is a Redeemer, Jesus God's own Son. O Lord, you're beautiful, your face is all I seek. Some of these songs we still sing today. One of his lesser known songs is called To Obey is Better Than Sacrifice. I'm going to read some of the words to, to us. The lyrics go like this. To obey is better than sacrifice. And then he speaks as if in, in the first, first person from God's perspective. I don't need your money. I want your life. While you speak of grace and my love so sweet, how you thrive on milk but reject my meat. And I can't help weeping of how it will be if you keep on ignoring my words. While you pray to prosper and succeed, but your flesh is something I just can't feed. To obey is better than sacrifice. I want more than Sunday and Wednesday nights. Here's another song that he wrote. It's called Make My Life a Prayer to You. Make my life a prayer to you. I want to do what you want me to. No empty words and no white lies. No token prayers. No compromise. I want to shine the light you gave through your son you sent to save us. From ourselves and our despair, it comforts me to know that you are really there. I want to die and let you give your life to me so I might live and share the hope you gave to me, the love that set me free. I want to tell the world out there, you're not some fable or fairy tale that I've made up inside my head. You're God, the Son, the risen from the dead. And he devoted his life to challenging and equipping the church. Not just worship, but worship and obedience together. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, says Paul. Don't just leave it at being saved, but work at expressing it, at living it out in every day. And remember, this is not about fear. This is not about guilt. Remember what kind of king Jesus is. If there's some area in your life that you feel the Lord tugging on your heart to continue to obey him, if you bring that to him, there's no shame in it. He won't condemn you. He won't say, oh, look at that. Look at you. you." He won't say shame on you. There's no condemnation in Jesus. If there's some area in your life, in relationship, in in your home, in your studies, in your work, that you feel you want to continue to bring to him in surrender of him, he will gladly receive that and he will bless you. He will give you life because this is what he's come to do. He, He cares about you and loves you so much that he would empty himself come down from heaven in the form of a human being for you to defeat sin and death. That's how much he cares for. He wants you to become like him in humility and obedience. 
So I want to transition now into a time of reflection, uh, give us an opportunity to lift up those areas in our lives um, where the Lord may be asking you to continue to obey him. Uh, in a moment today, we also get to celebrate communion, which is a wonderful, wonderful reminder of the good news. This is the gospel message kind of in concrete form. But before we do that, I want to give you an opportunity just to respond in your own heart. So I'm going to give you a few minutes. Um, and I want to invite you uh, to kneel. So I know that the chairs are not super conducive to that, but maybe uh, if you can, uh, if you're able to, and if you're willing to, um, why don't you lift the chairs up and then kneel on the ground as a sign of your uh, obedience. And if you can't, that's okay. Then I invite you to kneel uh, in your hearts. Mm. So bow your heads and in prayer with me, um, in, in the silence of your hearts. Maybe he's speaking to you about a certain area in your life that you want to continue to lift to him. And maybe it's something new in this season of your life, in this past week that he's brought to your attention. Maybe it's something that, that's been an area of challenge for maybe decades, maybe your whole life that he's asking you to continue to surrender to him. So be mindful of the people in your life, of the tasks in your life, the, the service in your life, the work in your life. What is it that Jesus is asking you to continue to surrender to him as your king and as your Lord? And if this is your heart's prayer, I invite you to pray it with me in your heart. Lord, I'm sorry for doubting your kingship in this area of my life. I'm sorry for resisting your kingship in my life, for trying to do things my own way. I'm sorry that I keep forgetting that I don't need to take matters into my own hands anymore, that I don't need to control or retaliate or to force my own way. I don't need to run away. Lord, I want to surrender again to you to your way, to the way that you do, do things, and to your will. Lord, may your kingdom come. Help me to obey.